this is our last session in this month's practice cycle exploring birth and death. And we've been doing it each week through the lens or through the vantage point of uh, one of the four turnings of Buddha Dharma, Buddhist teachings and practice. And uh, the first three turnings, just as a kind of reminder, include the first turning, which is the actual time of the start at the time that the Buddha was awakened and started teaching uh, the historical person, Siddhartha Gautama Buddha. And uh, we could call this the Sutrayana, the first turning. Um, Sutrayana meaning it's the, um, based on the sutras, the texts, the actual words of the Buddha. Um, the second turning is the Mahayana, which came several hundred years later. Um, and there's a major shift toward emptiness and toward non-duality and toward new understandings of interdependence and compassion arising in the practice and philosophy. Uh, then the third turning arises in northern India several hundred years later again, and then it gets incubated and developed in Tibet and eastern Asia. Um, and that's known as the Vajrayana, the third turning of the wheel of Dharma. And there you have the teachings on Buddha nature, uh, on the storehouse consciousness, on um, new forms of meditation that emphasize the always already doneness of awakening and how it's um, Dzogchen and Mahamudra and the Tibetan tradition focus on just being it already being done. Um, and, and, and these are very different kinds of practices and orientations that, that had emerged in early Buddhism, which is much more focused on the gradual process of uprooting um, these different hindrances in the mind. Um, and eventually attaining awakening. Here we're, they're saying awakening is already attained. Uh, it's just a question of remembering um, that that's true. Um, and then here we enter into a new era with the fourth turning. And, and the way I would describe, this is my personal take on the fourth turning, um, is that when the Western Enlightenment and the Eastern Enlightenments came together uh, in, in full force, in starting in the you know, 17, 1800s, going through until today, um, that's, that was the cause of the fourth turning, is the colliding of these different worldviews and perspectives and knowledge um, through people's lived experience as they wrestled with these different ancient paradigms and ideologies. Um, and that we're very much still in the process of figuring out what that means. I mean, even in the last, in our lifetimes, you know, the emergence of this, the internet, this hyper-connected mental infrastructure that lets us see each other at a distance and connect uh, and stay connected, always connected. Um, we have no idea what this, I, I, this is my opinion. We have no idea what that means for the, for the future of these traditions and practices uh, just that they're going to be different. Um, and for me, when I, when I studied, especially with Ken Wilber and was really into his integral theory, um, Ken Wilber is a, a philosopher, longtime Buddhist practitioner, a Zen practice and Tibetan Buddhist practice, very serious long-term practitioner. Um, and just an incredible scholar. Uh, I, I moved to Colorado actually to study with him in 2004 um, to try to work for his in, uh, re recently founded nonprofit institute. Uh, and I ended up getting a job as a web designer there, just fresh out of um, transferring from my computer engineering program I was studying at Naropa. And it was this incredible time and uh, period of all these really young, smart weirdos hanging around this big, tall, bald philosopher. Just a really weird scene, but it was incredible. I mean, there were some incredible people there. And coming through the scene regularly were all of these contemplative luminaries uh, who come and teach and talk to Ken. Uh, and he had these all, he was like, like the friends that were, you know, rock stars coming down from, you know, so-and-so to like hunt, come hang with Ken. It was really bizarre, <laughs> to be honest. Um, one, one weekend we'd have Father Thomas Keating and then the next weekend Eddie Kowalczyk from, you know, live would be there hanging out and Saul Williams, the street poet. 
And, and it was just, you know, an amazing, incredible confluence of perspectives happening uh, around this person, this philosopher. And one of the things that he taught about what he called the fourth turning well before a lot of other people were talking, were talking about this, um, is that we have to di- sort of identify and differentiate between these different dimensions of our human experience, which have been, we've learned about through these different Eastern and Western traditions. On, on the Eastern side, you know, we, we've learned an incredible amount about the process of waking up, of moving through accessing and dissolving different uh, strata of our own consciousness, Um, starting with the most gross and obvious, the physical body, physical impulses, moving to the most subtle mental states and feeling states. Um, All the way to the point where our perception can somehow seamlessly include everything that's arising, including the empty, formless void at the heart of its arising. Uh, We could call this the non-dual. So every tradition, East and West, that's really contemplative in nature, has a way of describing the process of waking up, and they have maps and models and stories and Um, allegories to describe the awakening process. And this is what we could call waking up. And this is what Ken Wilber often called waking up through what he said were state stages, stages of states of consciousness. Yet, and, but (laughs) there's another aspect of human uh, consciousness that we have to also look at, which is um, our process of cleaning up cleaning up. So this has to do with working with shadow material, shadow therapies, uh, healing work, uh, psychotherapeutic work, um, working with our content, our stories, our wounds, our traumas, our pains, um, our family histories, our ancestor, ancestry, um, the pains of the world at the deepest level. Um, and with the cleaning up process, we're going back and retrieving parts of ourself that we've left behind or that we couldn't relate to at the time that they're arising. And this is different than waking up. And we know that because there are a lot of very awakened people uh, in certain respects who are also <laughs> just, it's well known they're, tremendously neurotic in other respects. <laughs> and if you, know, if you hang out with a bunch of these kind of people for a while or have them as friends or married to them, um, you know, friends with them, or just spend time around people that have been interested in this awakening stuff for a while, you know, it just becomes very obvious that they're all human beings. Uh, and they all have their stuff still. And that's, what, that's the stuff that we work with when we clean up. Um, and then the third dimension I want to mention <laughs> in this um, metadharma consideration is uh, what Ken Wilber called structure stages. Uh, or we could call this growing up, waking up, cleaning up, growing up. Growing up has to do with maturing in certain kind of human ways that have to do with how we make sense of the world, how we make meaning, how we understand things, um, how we relate to ourselves and others, our sense of self, and how it's developed and where it's, how it's formed. Um, how we relate to others, to our environments. And this also comes out of the Western tradition and and something called uh, structuralism, post-structuralism, to look at the way that people's interiors change over time. And if there are trends in that direction, 
this, this kind of falls in the category of psychological development. And there are lots of different models and different you know, names for the stages. Uh, here today, you know, we're looking at five basic stages, egocentric, ethnocentric, world-centric, planet-centric, cosmocentric. Um, but there, you could go back to Jean Piaget and his work on child development and uh, look at his stages of concrete operational and post-formal operational and uh, all the ones I can't remember. <laughs> uh, Robert Keegan is one of my favorite adult developmental psychologists. Um, he, he studied, uh, is taught at Harvard for a number of years in research there. And um, he has uh, some very interesting uh, stages called orders of, he calls them orders of consciousness, five orders. Anyway, um, these structure stages um, from, from, from Ken's point of view, and I totally agree with this now. I, I haven't, didn't for a while, but I do now. Um, they're really important to track as well or to understand as well that these, this is a different aspect of our of our experience that meditating and becoming hyper aware and even resting in non-dual consciousness as our baseline doesn't transform the world by itself. You know, and it doesn't change our relationships. It doesn't necessarily by itself help us grow up into a deeper, wider, more expansive view of reality. Hopefully it, it helps do that. But, <laughs> You know, I've just seen time and again in myself and others, it's like how we can have profound awakenings and then still just be like not getting certain things. <laughs> uh, and this is, I think this is also part of what's disappointing, disillusioning about the awakening process. We see how really, in a certain way, how limiting, limited it is. Uh, but on the other hand, how powerful and profound. Um, so I just want to mention these three dimensions of human experience as, as being dimensions that we'd have to consider in looking at a fourth turning because they're different strands of human knowledge that have come down to us from East and West that um, help describe different aspects of our experience, which aren't collapsible to each other. When we collapse them to each other, when we don't differentiate them, uh, it causes it causes all kinds of problems. You know, we start to think the Zen master is you know perfect in every way, and then suddenly we're acting like a teenager. You know, because we think we've got this dad figure we can you know just like kick loose with, and he's going to not judge us and would never do anything to hurt us or harm us. Um, and suddenly he's like, wait a second, no. Like people are still, no matter how awake they are, they can still have neuroses, and um, there can be very different cultural understandings, uh, especially between East and West. A lot of teachers got very confused, <laughs> very different sexual backgrounds and, and, and cultural mores. The translation of that can be very weird. Um, so we can't collapse these things, and yet we have to integrate ourself uh, or integrate these aspects of ourself. And that's what metadharma to me is about. It's about taking a perspective on our journey that helps us see these different ways in which it's unfolding um, to be able to know, okay, what do I actually need in order to address this, which is actually most important to me right now. Like I really need to clean up around this issue and I really need to like do some work and get to the heart of this because it's getting in the way of my practice. It's getting in the way of my relationships. It's getting in the way of my work. Like it's really become a problem. Like, okay, well you don't need to just concentrate on it and treat it like a meditation object. You might need to go talk to someone about it you know, and, and go into like some sort of cognitive behavioral therapy or something like that. Like that might be a better solution than just trying to dissolve the sensations um, or read a philosophy, you know, read Kant and see how Kant says about this. <laughs> Do you get what I'm saying? Okay, I'll stop there.